To begin with, let's look at what a robot system in software will look like when we build one. We will start with this and then gradually bring in ROS so that the idea of ROS in an intuitive way is super clear for us. Hello guys, so this video is the first one in this series which is all about ROS and robotics. We will start with the idea of ROS and then gradually start working with robot operating system which is ROS. For uh, robot applications, we'll specifically use ROS1 and ROS2 and I think we're gonna focus more on ROS2 as the series progresses. This video is all about understanding what ROS is in a very intuitive way. So what does ROS stand for? ROS stands for Robot Operating System. We all know that of course. It is the most popular middleware used for building robot systems right now and it enables the following when we are building a robot system. One, message passing between different modules in a distributed system. Two, package management. And three, hardware abstraction. Well, this isn't the most intuitive way to understand ROS, right? So let's forget about ROS for a bit and start from the problem statement which led to the creation of ROS and how we use it now. To begin with, let's look at what a robot system in software will look like when we build one. We will start with this and then gradually bring in ROS so that the idea of ROS in an intuitive way is super clear for us. As an example, let's say we want to build a humanoid trash picking robot called Billy. Billy keeps looking at its surroundings to find trash. When it finds trash, it moves to the location, picks up trash and throws it in the bin. And the process continues. This is a rather contrived example, I know, but it will serve the purpose and help us understand the idea of ROS later on. In a naive way, we can divide Billy's software stack in three broad categories. One, perception where we actually look at the surroundings. Two, actuation. This module is responsible for Billy to move. Three, brain. This is the central uh, module where all the decisions are actually made. And this module will decide what Billy should do at any point in time. Next, let's imagine that to build this system, we divide this system into three broad categories as I mentioned before. Perception, actuation, and brain. And this would also reflect in our software stack. Remember that this is a gross oversimplification to drive the message home, but please bear with me for a bit. So, we have three scripts, perception, actuation, and brain. For the sake of this argument, let's say we are building in Python, so we would have perception.py, actuation.py, and brain.py. How will the flow of this information be? First, perception will keep looking at its surroundings to understand if there is trash somewhere. If there is trash, it will inform brain about the presence of trash, and then brain will decide how the robot or Billy should move to that exact location. Once Brain has computed the path, it will ask Actuation to move the robot. And this process repeats again and again as and when uh, Perception looks at Crash. Now, we started off with the idea that we have three modules and then we started talking about how these three modules will communicate, the flow of information, right? So if we want to establish communication between these modules, how would we go about it? One idea would be polling. In polling, perception will keep looking for trash and when it finds any trash, it will write to a shared memory location about the presence of trash at the location of trash. Brain will keep polling the shared memory location to find the presence of data. Once it finds something, that means that there is trash. Then brain will process this information and write to another shared location. This shared location is constantly polled by actuation so that it understands when brain has written something in that shared location. If there is something in that location, it basically means that the actuation has been given a command from brain. And then actuation will move according to what brain told actuation. This is very similar to the shared location between perception and brain, right? Brain was constantly polling the shared location where perception wrote information. But in the other case, actuation is constantly looking at the shared location. Now, polling is not the most efficient way in a hardware software co-design system. So, there is another idea, which is called interrupts. If you've worked as an embedded or a software engineer, you would know that interrupts is something which is event-driven. Now, if we move away from polling to an event-based system, what we can do is perception will look for trash as it was doing before, and then it will write somewhere that it found trash, when it does, of course. Now, brain, instead of polling the space, will get an interrupt when perception writes something there and then brain will process this information and write somewhere about what actuation should do. Now, actuation will also get an interrupt. We now moved away from a polling-based system to an event-based system. This is much more efficient. This is, of course, a very simplistic example to drive the message home, but establishing this event-based communication channel 
is exactly what ROS does. Instead of us taking care of all the communication in this distributed system with these three uh, subsystems, ROS says, don't worry about communication between these modules. I will take care of it. I will provide you APIs where you can tell me what kind of communication you need to have between these modules. And I will give you APIs to also set up these connections. All you need to do is build your individual modules properly and tell me how these connections should look like. So we don't need to implement these communication channels anymore because ROS is responsible for it now. By the way, this is the core definition of a middleware. A middleware is responsible for message passing, as we said before, and handling communication between different submodules in a distributed system. So without getting into all the jargons initially, we've established that ROS is responsible for handling this inter-process or inter-module or inter-package communication in this distributed system, which exactly is something a middleware does. Hence, ROS is a middleware, right? That's now easy for us to understand. So the first idea of message passing is what we were talking about till now. Let's move on to the second one. And for that, let's go back to our system design again. Since ROS is handling these communication channels, we can develop these individual modules or packages, which is a terminology in ROS. We can focus on developing these individual packages. ROS has tools to support creation and maintenance of these packages. In ROS1, it's called Catkin, and in ROS2, it's called Colcon. These are standard package management tools which are incorporated in ROS for package management. So now in ROS, you can make these individual packages using these tools, and then you can manage these packages, add whatever you want and work on them in isolation. So when you're working on, let's say, actuation package, you don't need to really work on brain and uh, perception. If you're actually working on brain and perception when you need to change something major in actuation, that means the design is not modular enough. So there has to be some design improvements. So the second idea of package management is what we were talking about now. Let's move on to the third one. Let's say you're building one package and then that package actually needs you to have a lot of embedded drivers and code to talk to your hardware. You can actually build this core embedded functionality dedicated to a specific hardware and then wrap it with all ROS APIs you have. So in the end, you can have your core ROS functionalities, which is not really about ROS, but it is about the hardware and then use ROS APIs to make a package out of it. Now this package can be used by yourself or anyone else when they are using this specific hardware. So that means you've abstracted your hardware functionalities out, right? If you made something for the specific hardware device and I want to use it, I can use your package. I don't need to build any driver code for this hardware device. I can actually use your package and all of that hardware functionality in code is abstracted out. So that makes it easier for me to use your ROS package if it's about a specific hardware. So these were the three core ideas we covered to understand what ROS is. Also, because ROS is so popular now, there are so many open source packages where the people have built packages for very specific functionalities and everyone can use them. So that means that because of how big the community is, you can get packages for important functionalities and then just use them as plug and play modules. You don't really need to develop these modules on your own. For instance, if you want to work on robot localization for mobile robots, there is a package called robot localization. If you want to work on navigation, there is a package called navigation or navigation 2. So there are many, many packages for this. But bear in mind that if you are building a project or a product, you have to make a lot of custom packages for this. But that is something we will deal with later. It's too early to talk about those things. I hope the idea of ROS is much more clear with this video now. When I started working with ROS initially just for my own interest, it took me a while to understand the core idea of ROS. It just looked like a giant software stack which does something and then it's important in ROS. But honestly, ROS is not really about robotics. I consider it to be a middleware or a software stack which is really good for hardware software co-design. In fact, I would have named it Hardware Software Co-Design Operating System. But like the name is atrocious, so of course I would never want to do that. Also, it is not an operating system. It just mimics some of the functionalities of an operating system. And that's why I think it's named Robot Operating System. But it is a middleware, which is something we discussed before. So I hope the idea is clear for you. Next up, we will talk about ROS2 and how ROS2 is different from ROS1. And then we will also start building in simulation using ROS2. So I hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one.